Uh, have any of you ever felt misjudged by somebody who didn't know you? Anybody ever felt that way? Uh, I know I definitely have. I think we all have to some degree or another. Those of you that raise your hand are being honest. The rest of you are just lying in church. That's okay. I'm not judging you. I'm not judging you. But, but, but I, I remember when my wife and I, we'd been married for just a couple of years, the first time we ever went to Los Angeles. And everybody said, hey, you've got to go to Rodeo Drive. And so we're like, okay, well, that's cool. We'll go do some shopping on Rodeo Drive. And so we were walking through some of these stores and some of you are laughing because you've been there. And what I realized fairly quickly after getting there is that the very cheapest, most inexpensive item on Rodeo Drive cost more than we had in our checking, savings, and retirement accounts combined. Uh, we had no business being there. I, and, and, and the people that we inter, interfaced with, they knew it too. I don't know if it was the Goodwill clothes or, or you know, the Old Navy, I don't know what it was, but they were like, these people cannot afford to be here. But we decided, you know what? We're here, let's just take advantage of it. So we played dress up in the dressing rooms on Rodeo Drive. And so I remember walking out of a dressing room at one point and like looking at Lisa and going, I've got $20,000 worth of clothes on right now. <laughs> take a picture, quick. You know, and, uh, but they judged us. They knew we, we couldn't afford to be there and they were right. But then here's what they did. They put a security guard on us. They thought we were looking for a five-finger discount, and they were wrong. We were, we were poor, but we were not thieves, and we were misjudged, and it's a silly example, but, but it never feels good to be misjudged by somebody. Well, they take a small window of what they know about you, and then they come to conclusions that aren't true, and it happens to all of us from time to time, and if we were being honest, most of us do it to others from time to time as well. Well, we're jumping into James chapter two. If you have your Bibles, you can... You can uh, open up there, and as we, as we dive into it, I wanna, I wanna ask you, have you ever felt misjudged? Most of us, whether it's the, the, the size of our bank account, some of us because of the color of our skin, or maybe it's a disability, maybe it's how we treat or raise our kids, maybe it's the political party that we affiliate with, we've all been misjudged for some reason or another outside of these walls, but what James is gonna show us is that inside of these walls, it should never happen. Let's, let's look at it together. James chapter two, verses one through four. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? We, we've already established James just doesn't beat around the bush. He comes straight at it. How can you call yourself a Christian if you show favoritism to some people over others? And then he gives an example. He says, for example, Suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the one wearing Gucci, but you say to the one wearing Goodwill, you can stand over there, or, or why don't you come sit right here, and that was a, a way of them saying, you need to sit under my teaching, let me teach you, let me show you something. So if you do that, if you treat people that way, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives. Evil motives. You know, he's saying everyone else is gonna assign labels to people. Everyone else is gonna, gonna judge people based on external circumstance. That's what the word favoritism means or show favor. It, means, it, it literally means to be a, a respecter of persons based on a superficial external status such as the appearance, race, wealth, social status, or rank. And this is the bottom line. It is never okay for us as believers to treat people differently based on outward appearances. Never. That's what James is saying. Bottom line, it's never okay. And it's not just about judging uh, the poor and, and, and instead of the rich. God's character from the beginning of time, he, he says, don't show partiality. Leviticus 19, 15, which James would have known that verse, he says, do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people fairly. And, 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 and so in that case, he's saying, don't give favor to the poor, don't give favor to the rich, don't be partial. What he's not saying, and I just wanna say this because some of us will get this confused, he's not saying that we as believers shouldn't judge each other or hold each other accountable to certain things. We absolutely need that. Uh, I was at the father-daughter dance and, and my friend Derek, who's looking at me right now, I was walking with my Chick-fil-A and my Diet Coke and he was like, hey dude, is that on the diet? Do you want me to tell Lisa about that? 
you know what, I needed that. I, I needed a little bit of that. You know, that's, that's, that's accountability. That's brothers holding each other accountable. That's, that's I crave that. But it's, it's when we're at the gym and someone walks in and they're bigger than us or smaller than us and we begin to make judgments about them or treat them differently or when they come into the church and we, we begin to make conclusions about people based on a little bit of information that we have on them. And that's where James is like, dude, it's a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. And so what I want us to do for a couple of minutes together is look at it. What's the big deal? Why is James harping on this? Why is he making it such a big deal with favoritism? The first one for us, if you have an outline sheet you can follow along, is number one, it's an indicator of the current condition of my heart. When I judge somebody or, or show favoritism to somebody, it's a current indicator of, 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 of the current condition of my heart. Look again at verse one and four. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? Well, what's he saying here? He's saying that one of the best indicators of my relationship with Christ is the way that I treat the marginalized in our society, in our culture. That one of the best indicators of my relationship, my heart with God, is how I treat people who are marginalized. And I, I can imagine James going, hey, I, th this, this is my brother Jesus that you're talking about. H how could you call yourself a follower of him and, and then go and do these things? Like, did you, do you not know the character of my brother? Did you not hear about the time that everybody else called this woman the adulterous woman, but Jesus stepped in and he loved her and he called her daughter and he said, go, and he released her of our sins. Or, or, or my brother Jesus, he's the one that was going to this very wealthy man's house to, to heal his child and he stopped and chose to be late to that appointment for an anonymous woman who had had issues all of her life and he stopped and he gave her attention. He didn't show partiality and we shouldn't either. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 25. It's, 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 he sets up this scenario and, and essentially what he tells us is that Jesus vicariously receives love through the way that we treat the least of these. He, he, he says at the end of the days, when, when I return, I'm gonna be sitting on my throne and he says all of the nations will be in front of me. That includes you and me, all of us. And he says I'm gonna divide them in two categories. I'm gonna have the sheep on one side and the goats on another side. And I'm gonna turn over to the sheep and I'm gonna tell them, you righteous people, this is the moment that you've been waiting for. This is the moment that, that my father and I have been planning for. Time to, to come and receive your inheritance. To come and let's feast and let's party and let's do it. And he's like, it's, come on in. And, and he knows people are gonna be like, well, uh, why? Like what, what separates the two groups? And look what he says in Matthew 25, verse 35. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And I can imagine a rumble kind of begins to go through the crowd and people are going, uh, th did you do that? Like, I, I don't remember doing that. I don't remember Jesus at that, that time. I don't remember when you were sick. And that's, that's the response. He says that the righteous are gonna answer and say, Lord, when did, we, when did we do all of that? When did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we visit you in prison? And, and he says, at the very end, he says, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, you touched my heart. You did it for me. And then he turns to this other group and he says, but, but you, yeah, I, I was hungry and you never, you never offered me anything to eat. I was thirsty and, and you didn't offer me anything to drink. And he goes back through the same list and, and he says, what, whatever you didn't do to the least of these, you didn't do it for me. And then he says, go, go on to your eternal punishment. And it's a harsh, harsh passage of scripture. And, and I, I wonder how many of the people on this side, sorry if you sat on this side, you just kind of ended up in, in the wrong group today, but, but I wonder how many of them were like, dude, I, I was in church. I, 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 you know, I, I worshiped, I raised my hands even. I mean, I, I, I loved you, but Jesus says, you know what? 
One of the ways that I receive love is by the way you treat the marginalized in society. And, and, and he says, you, you can't separate loving the Lord your God from loving your neighbor. The two are, are, are interwoven, they're connected. And that one of the best ways to express love to God is to love people in need. You know, we did that reverse offering a few months ago, and that's part of why we did that, is, is to, 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 for us to see what it, what, it, what it feels like to just be generous to people in need. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a buddy of mine, his name's Horace, he walked in to the church and he was like, hey, I gotta tell you my reverse offering story. I was like, all right, well, let me hear about it. And he said, man, it's been so amazing. We took that $5 that you gave and we, we added our own, we took about $20 and we went to a laundromat and we, we just decided we got all, all of it put in quarters and we would just pay for people to do their laundry. And he was like, it's been amazing. People are, are, are loving it, people are, but, but he was like, man, but it's been so great for our family that we decided we do it every week now. 20 bucks a week, we go and we go to the laundromat and it's the highlight of our week. And it was awesome and it's cool that people are, are receiving kindness from him, but what's awesome to see is that the condition of his heart is being impacted by the way he's treating the least of these. By the way he's respecting and, and, and honoring and loving these people. He's literally touching the heart of God as he serves the least of these. And, and, and so we, we can't separate our love from God from how we, we treat the marginalized. And that's a hard thing to hear for some of us. Some of us are here today and maybe you feel like, man, I feel a, a lot of conviction coming over me. I mean, that's, that's a difficult verse and I just wanna encourage you, that's really good news. <laughs> Last I checked, we're all still taking breath, and Jesus gave this as a warning, and, and we, have, we have opportunity when, when we read God's word and something kind of pierces in a tough way for us to go, okay, God, I'm gonna choose today to repent. I, I wanna come into alignment with your word, with your will, with you, and we're gonna give you an opportunity to do that. So that's really, really good news for all of us to be able to go to the cross during response time and, and respond to him. But I also wanna say to another group of people that are here, maybe you are one of those that feel overlooked or feel marginalized in some way because of the size of your bank account or, or, or because of a disability, whatever it might be. And I just want you to know that God's heart for you is he honors you, he values you, and we wanna be a church that does our very best to represent his heart to everyone, everyone, regardless of where you are. So we, we don't show favoritism because when we do, it reveals the condition of our heart. But another reason, another, another reason it's a really big deal is, is this, is appearances never tell the whole story. Because appearances never tell the whole story. See, when I judge somebody based on external appearances, I almost always get it wrong. And this happened to me just this past weekend. Uh, we uh, had church last weekend, I was here, Pastor Darren Patrick was preaching, and. I had heard the message a couple times and during the 11 o'clock service, I decided to go out into the foyer and just be a blessing, at least in my own mind. You know, just connect with people and, and hang out. And I, I go over to the Dream Team Central, which is where our dream team, which is uh, what we call our, our volunteers here at Seacoast, we're hanging out. And uh, my son was in there and he's playing, he wanted to play ping pong with me. We have a ping pong table over there. He said, Dad, can we play ping pong? I was like, yeah, I'd love to. And so I went and, and we played three games and, and he's 12 and I whooped him badly, all three games. I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you what, what happened. And so, <laughs> so I beat him and, and we're hanging out and getting ready to leave. And this gentleman named Larry says, hey, pastor, you got one more game in you. And I thought, yeah, I got another game in, in me. And, and I'm thinking, I'm gonna have to take it easy on Larry because Larry's a good bit older than me. He's a good bit older than my dad. He may be older than my grandpa. He's a great guy. He serves in the parking lot, fantastic guy. But I'm just, he just doesn't move like he used to, okay? And that's not just, I just knew, all right, Josh, you gotta take it easy on Larry. And so he gets up and he takes his jacket off and, and he moves pretty slowly over to the, the ping pong table, gets a paddle and, and I said, Larry, do you, want, do you want me to warm you up a little bit? And he said, no, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm, I'm feeling pretty warm. I was like, okay, that's fine. Why don't, why don't you serve? And so Larry served the ball and I never saw it. <laughs> like, I, I was like, dude, what are, you, what are you doing? And this guy had spin and all this stuff and he's beating me like 14 to four. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Finally, I started working the sideline to sideline deal because he couldn't move as fast as me. So I was able to at least get a couple of shots in. But, but Larry, he whooped me. He, he kicked my butt in, in ping pong and, and, and I didn't think there was any way that was possible. 
And the reality is when we make judgments on people based on an external circumstance or what they look like, we're almost always gonna get it wrong. And it caused a good bit of embarrassment to me. I should have known when everybody in the dream team got up and started watching before we even started. I'm like, they know what's going on here and I don't. But, but Larry, Larry's a, a pretty good ping pong table player, a table tennis player, and, and, it, and, and I would have never guessed it. Don't judge people by external appearances. You're probably gonna be wrong. And look what James says in verse five. He says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom that he promised those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Christ, whose noble name that you bear? Say, man, when you, when you show favoritism in that way, you, you're getting it all wrong. Like you're telling the poor people to come sit under your teaching so you can show them something about God. You need to come sit under their teaching. They are the, the ones who are inheriting the kingdom of heaven. They are rich in the eyes of God. And you're getting it all wrong. And, and you're sucking up to the, to the rich, and man, these are the ones that are gonna throw you into jail. These are the ones that are gonna, gonna take you to court. He was prophesying what was actually gonna happen a few years later. Because when, when we judge people based on external, external circumstances, we almost always get it wrong. And that's what he's saying. Why would a, why would a church person show favoritism to somebody who's wealthy? Because they're hoping they could do something for them, Right? They're hoping maybe they could help support the building campaign or help do something. But when we judge people, we almost always get it wrong. It's like the, uh, the receptionist at a church that I heard about. She uh, had taken a call from a guy and answers the phone. And the guy sounds pretty, pretty rough and tumble. He says, hey, I need to speak to the head hog at the trough. And she says, well, excuse me, sir? And he says, I need to speak to the head hog at the trough. You heard what I said. Now she knows she heard him clearly. And she said, sir, I'm sorry, but if you wanna to talk to our pastor, you're gonna to have to speak a little bit more honorably and respectfully. We don't call him that. We call him Pastor Smith or, or, or the, the Reverend, but you don't call him that. And he says, I'm, I'm so sorry, ma'am. I've got a check here for $50,000. I just wanted to talk to the person I could give it to. And she said, oh, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. In fact, the fat pig just walked in right now. Let me put him on the phone for you. <laughs> right? You know, we almost always get it wrong. You know, we almost always get it wrong when we judge people based on external circumstances. And, and, and I think it's important for us to realize that, that man, uh, so often, the little bit of limited information that we have, we're gonna get wrong. In research, if you make a decision based on a few points of data, what they call that is a mistake waiting to happen. You're just gonna miss it, yet we do it so often in our own lives. And so what's the big deal with favoritism? One, it reveals the condition of our heart. In other words, it tells us a whole lot more about us than the people that we're judging. Number two, there's always more to the story. There's always more to the story. And number three, I will be judged by the same standard that I use on others. I will be judged by the same standard that I use on others. James continues here and he says, for the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who's broken all of God's laws. The same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. And so he's, he's telling them not to show favoritism, but then he's kind of, he's leveling the playing field. He's saying, hey, is there any one of you who hasn't broken one of the laws, right? Like when we get to the end of judgment, we all wanna be judged based on mercy. We want other people judged on justice, but we know we need mercy. And, and if we were to go through the 10 commandments, probably by the time I got to honor your father and your mother, we would all have fallen short, right? And if you somehow made it past that one, the part about bearing a false witness or ever lying, half of you did that in church already today, but we, we've all done it, right? And I love how my dad used to explain it to us when we were kids growing up. He said, hey, if I just put a little bit of dog poop in the brownie batter, you'd be cool with that, right? We'll still eat the brownies. It's like, no, that's gross, dad. He said, that's how sin is. It just takes a little bit to corrupt everything. And, and our condition is we need mercy. We need a savior. That's what Jesus came to do for us, to die on a cross so that all of us are, are level at the playing field of Jesus. He died for our sins so that we could experience his mercy. And so, so he says in verse 12, so whatever you say or whatever you do, 
Remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. The law of liberty is what some versions say. Saying, don't, don't forget that when God judges you, he's judging you through the lens of Jesus with mercy. But then he says there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you've been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Some versions say mercy triumphs over judgment. We all want mercy, right? Lord, we know, we judge other people based on their actions, but we judge ourselves based on our motives, right? Well, God, you know my heart was right. We want God to show mercy on us. And what James is saying is, hey, you're gonna be judged with the same way that you judge other people. So let's become people of mercy. Let's become people of mercy. How do we do that? That's probably a whole nother sermon, but I wanna give you one idea. If we're gonna become the kind of people who learn to show mercy over judgment, simply we need to do this. Get close enough to people that you can, you can learn their story. Get close enough to people that you can learn and understand their story. See, when we see people's stories, the whole picture, we tend to have a lot more grace and a lot more mercy for them. But when we slap a label on them because of one thing that we know about them or one thing that we see, we get it wrong. I think about uh, my, my own journey. You know, this is Black History Month, uh, the month of February. I'm sure many of you know that. And Martin Luther King Jr. Day is in, is, is in January. And for me, Martin Luther King Jr. Day was always a great day because I got off of school, right? I mean, that's what it was for me growing up. It's, it's about as much as I understood about that whole deal. And so I was super grateful for it. But as I grew up and as I uh, expanded my friendship circles and got close to some people and understood their stories, I, I began to realize, man, this is much more than that. I began to realize what he stood for and what he fought for. And I would begin to post some things on, on my social media on that day and, and try to you know, just encourage people to, to, to know who he was. But man, I'll tell you when it really changed for me, my, my perspective changed in massive ways, is, is when I began to go down to the Martin Luther King Jr. parade that we do here in Charleston. Uh, there's a group of seacoasters that began doing that a couple of years ago. And man, it is amazing to, to walk the streets, to spend literally hours with people hearing their story. Hey, tell me about this, tell me, and I'm not saying that I've figured all of this out by any means, and, I, and, and nor do we need to. We all see from a different lens, but we need to get close to people so we can understand. And what I mean by we don't need to is, is my friends aren't looking for me to solve their problems or fix anything, they just want me to understand where they are and, and walk with them. And as we get close to people, we begin to see things from a little bit different perspective and we understand people's stories and we begin to show mercy and grace towards people. Let, let me illustrate it for you in this way. I've got a picture that I wanna show you on the screen of a pair of shoes. You guys all see the pair of shoes? Uh, you're like, what, what, what does that have to do with anything? Well, let me show you how our, our perspectives can be different. How many of you, when you look at that pair of shoes, you see a pair of shoes that is gray and, and teal or blue? Just raise your hand if you see that, okay? I want the rest of you to look around. Keep those hands in the air. You guys are like, what is wrong with those people? <laughs> How many of you see pink and white shoes? Raise your hand, okay. You guys are more normal, because that's what I see. <laughs> but but the, the reality is, is that both of us are seeing exactly what our eyes are telling us to see. This is one of those pictures that depending on whether you uh, predominantly use your right brain or your left brain, you see one of two things. And I see some of you who are husbands and wife and you see things differently. And I promise you, you could argue until you're blue in the face. That shoe is pink and white. Look at it, look at the laces, look at the soles, look at the, and you could argue and you could argue and you're not gonna change their perspective because they see it through a different lens. Now take the picture down because they're not listening to me anymore. They're looking at the shoe, <laughs> trying to figure that out. But I don't understand how, how all of that works uh, as far as the shoe goes, but I, what, what it helps me see is that, man, I am seeing through one lens and there are other people who are seeing through different lenses and we need to show mercy to those people. What I am not saying is that there's no truth, that there's no absolute truth. I'm not saying that at all. I believe there absolutely is, that God's word is our guide and all of that is true. But when we make snap judgments about people based on limited information, we're probably getting it wrong. And we need to learn how to get close enough to people that we can hear their story 
and see their perspective and honor and value the image of God that is in every single person. You know, as I was studying for this message, I, uh, for, for a while, and, and I, Lisa told me not to tell you this, but I'm gonna tell, you, tell it to you anyways, just full transparency. You know, I love God's word, but as we teach through God's word, there are some passages of scripture that you're just super excited about and they, they resonate with you, and then there are other passages of scripture that are harder to, to grapple with. And, and sometimes as, as pastors, our job isn't to preach what we like preaching, it's to preach the whole word of God. And this was one that I was having a hard time just seeing or getting excited about in certain ways until just a, a few days ago, I feel like God began to really put this in my heart. And I believe that this is a prophetic moment for our church. I really do. To really take hold of these 13 verses and go, I wanna be a person that lives this out. Because you know what, 2020 is upon us and it's an election year. And I've, I've lived through enough election years to know that it is gonna get really nasty out there. That, 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 that it's gonna be divisive and there are gonna be people that say things and label people. And, and here, here's what I know about this church. We have people in this church that vote a lot of different ways. And here's what I wanna tell you as your pastor. I am way less concerned with who you vote for than I am with how you treat the people that vote differently than you do. And I believe that, that I don't care what it looks like out there, we can set a different atmosphere in here where we just honor the heck out of people. We just treat people well. We, we, we don't judge them based on little bits of information that we're a church that, that elevates the marginalized, that cares for them, that sees them for who they are, that treats people who vote differently or look differently or act differently with honor and respect because mercy triumphs over judgment. I, I, my prayer for us this year is that, man, this just takes hold in our hearts and that, that no matter what it looks like out there, that we begin to change the world in here and when we do that, when we take hold of it in here, it will seep out to out there. And so would you guys pray with me as we, as we close? God, I, I thank you for our church. I thank you for this incredible place that we have to worship you. And I thank you for your word, Lord, that, that speaks directly to our hearts. And God, would you help us with this? Lord, as the number one in line, Lord, sinner in this, God, it's, it's so easy for me to judge people based on limited information that I have. God, I pray that you would wreck our hearts, that you would change our hearts, and that you would help us to become people who represent you accurately to others around us. God, I pray that we would be people that honor and bless your name by the way that we treat people. Lord, that you would receive love not only by how we worship in these walls, but how we treat people outside of here. And we just pray, Lord, that you would search us and know us and Lord, that we would respond to you with open hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.